us here on Live Now from Fox. We want to take you right out to this news that we're just getting in. Ocean Gate is hosting a news conference. They are the owner of the company of the sub that catastrophically imploded. It's the first time that we're hearing from them on camera. Let's bring you this here live from East Aurora, New York, and listen in. The entire evolution of this response, this same fundamental focus was at the core of how all of our teams did their job. During the urgency of the rescue at hand, we were always conscious of the crew of the Titan, their families and friends, and the safety of all the responders. We focused our efforts to arrive on the site of Titanic, prepared to rescue Titan. I have to acknowledge our team here. Many of them are heading home. Many of them are still traveling. And we have team members here. I just want to point out uh, Jesse Doran, who's our ROV manager, director of operations, uh, and other members of the team here. The first thing I'm going to do is give you a timeline of events, give you a sense of the sequence. So it started June 18th, Sunday, the loss of the communications and tracking to Titan. <coughs> About 17.45, local noon time, Eastern Day at time, we were contacted by Ocean Gate. I landed at JFK Airport at around 11 o'clock and was in conversation with their director of operations immediately, assessed the situation, and we were asked to activate our deep water remotely operated vehicle system, Odysseus 6 k We immediately began assembling a team sending some to St. John's immediately, and sending others here to East Aurora. On June 19th, which is Monday, PRS began packing and mobilizing the Odysseus 6K armor group. Throughout the day, PRS staff arrived on site, and by late afternoon, PRS was at Buffalo Niagara International Airport, mobilized for deployment, where, two U.S. Air Force C-17s were waiting for us. With the equipment staged at the airport, PRS awaited the arrival of yet another C-17 with additional equipment required to not only load our kit at Buffalo, but to offload it at St. John's, Newfoundland International Airport. Tuesday, June 20th, 0400, we began loading to the three C-17s at the airport. We soon departed, arriving at St. John's, Newfoundland in the early afternoon. All three aircraft sequenced, all three aircraft organized in a manner to require the most efficient mobilization to the ship arriving in the Arctic, which was waiting for us. The offload was immediate and focused. Awaiting us was a ship and a team and a community ready to engage us, to get us onto the ship, and to get us underway. The last load, container, ship, you know, the truck arrived at the pier side, 2300, on June 20th. The ship was underway the next day, June 21st, at 0530. And the last truck arriving to us leaving the pier was about five and a half to six hours. 70,000 pounds of equipment. Ship underway, sight of the Titanic, and the loss of, or the missing submersible at this point, of course, was tight. I just want to emphasize the whole response team that we were going to integrate into was underway. There were at least 10 ships and aircraft active already on site. Odysseus 6K, as the 6,000 meter mobile ROV system, became the primary asset focused on rescue. Underway to the site, we finished the integration and activation of the vehicle and rigged it for rescue. Plain and simple, we were focused on rescue. We arrived on site less than 24 hours later. 0430 local lead times, we arrived in Arctic integrated into the ongoing and multinational rescue effort. 
At that point, within an hour, 0530, our system was launched from the back deck and began to descend to the seafloor. Shortly after arriving on the seafloor, we discovered the debris of the Titan submersible. Of course, we continued to document the site, and by 12 o'clock, sadly, a rescue turned into a recovery. To apologize for it. still the old line. A lot of emotions, people are dying. During this period, upon arriving on site, we have to point out that the U.S. Coast Guard Incident Command reached out to the families of the Titan crew upon our discovery of the bird. A very important communication. We can then continue then, of course, to perform an operation from rescues are recovered. So from basically June 22nd till June 27th at 9.30, our teams, and I say our teams, because it was the integrated team of the Horizon Arctic and the Pelagic team, and many, many, many others, were conducting 24-hour ROV operations as directed by the on-site commander. We will, of course, use our heavy lift capability to recover all the objects of interest as directed by the incident response. Just to complete the timeline for you, on June 28th, 0730 local mean time, St. John's, Newfoundland, Horizon Arctic with the Pelagic Embark team arrived at the Canadian Coast Guard base, where wreckage was offloaded and our demobilization began. Today is June 30, and it's 24 hours ago we were on site. We really have to take that into perspective. Before taking questions, a few more points. We're still reviewing the sequence of events that we were a part of. During the drive from New York JFK to here, the incident command structure, of course, had been activated for a few days. And that integrated command structure that we were participating in was being facilitated by Vice Admiral William J. Glanis, who's the commander of Naval Sea Systems Command. So after OceanGate had activated us, we were immediately blended into the incident command structure. I ask us all here today to recognize the seriousness of the, of the seriousness of the event and respect the depth and range of emotions, certainly and most importantly, the family and friends of the Titan and all those in their response. I'm happy to take questions. What was it like at that moment of, of discovery of debris? If you can, and I know it, again it's emotional for you, but if you can describe what happened, what kind of um, the protocol did you follow? There was a clearly, when we arrived on site, you know, we became, the, we were the primary identified asset to effect rescue. There was a fleet of ships. We came in next to a ship called Deep Energy, an industry ship. Their vehicle was at 2,700 meters. They were not capable of going deeper. But I want to point out that Deep Energy had sent, they had two armor. Prior to our arrival on site, they had sent one ROV to C4 beyond their depth capability. And it unfortunately mechanically had an issue. So that is just the scope. You are listening in live here from East Aurora, New York, the company that assisted with the recovery operation of this deadly submersible implosion that happened is speaking out on that investigation. Some viewers here will see a quick two minute break as we continue to listen in here. If they had a lifting line at 3,000 meters, it's design, key design characteristics. We've always known and we've always wanted to be available for these types of situations. Wish the call never came, but we wanted to be ready when it did. And so it's designed to withstand depths up to 6,000 meters. All the equipment, everything on there has to operate at that depth. Importantly, it has seven function manipulators, high definition 4K cameras, 
and the lift capability of multiple, multiplicity of tools to allow us to do work at depth. Where was Odysseus built? Did, were you involved in the construction of this ROV, and where was it actually built? And is it housed here normally? So Odysseus 6K is a, our design, and it was built by MPH Engineering in Largo, Florida. A very strong collaboration with the fabricator, and we worked together to build this system. It first became operational in 2016. And our primary market is deep sea science. So we work a lot with the University of Victoria, Ocean Networks Canada as an example, you know, and other groups. This is our operational base. We're a mobile system, so in a sense we can be anywhere. So this gets lowered, what, what part of, of this that we're looking at okay. gets, the, you know, is, is that what ends up on so the this floor? this entire vehicle goes to the seafloor. What you're seeing here is an integrated launch and recovery system. You can barely see the umbilical here. This allows the vehicle to be taken off deck, rotated over the side, and then lowered to the seafloor. In this image here, you can see the whole setup, right? So here's our integrated launch and recovery system, our winch with 7,000 meters of umbilical, control room, which is there, workshop. We're, we're independent of the ship, and that's part of our plan, right? We need to come in and function immediately. And I say that, but I also need to point out that the success or the opportunity for success, the opportunity to be on site and achieve what we all hope we would achieve is a function of integrating with the ship. We have a philosophy called the one team. It has to work. The ship crew, the embark science, or in this case, the other personnel, and our ROV team have to become one team. It's a very dangerous thing that happens out there. Just offloading from a truck. Just offloading it from a truck is dangerous. We have to keep, you know, our thing is safety first. Safety of personnel, number one. Safety of equipment, number two. And objective, number three. Now, I will say, we push something, and everybody pushed something on this response. Now, you're. They, you, you said you're, it's a, a unique design for you guys, right? You, you, this was your design. Are you the only ones with uh, equipment capable to go down that low and recover what you did based on the fact that the other ship, their uh, unit malfunctioned? It didn't malfunction, it, it pushed it beyond its depth rate. So did your, did, uh, saying is your, is your machine one of the few that can actually go down that far and be okay? Yes, I mean, there are other systems like it, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, they exist in many parts of the world. But I think what makes our system somewhat unique is its capabilities and its mobility. Ed, you might want to speak to the fact uh, that the continued operations really is a testament to the design and the functionality. Uh, we're looking at a almost flawless operation 24-7. I think yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, in some ways, I think, you know, as we look back at this, which we will, it was unprecedented in the sense, our ability to arrive at seafloor and then go to work. And then we worked for another five or six days at 3,800 meters. And then we began the recovery operations, which in and of themselves are quite challenging. Can you discuss a little bit again, I, you, you mentioned your rescue, you were raked for rescue. Would the articulating arms have been able to, say, attach a cable to Titan if it had not imploded? to try to lift it off the surface or the uh, sea floor? Is that kind of what you were getting there? Yeah, we felt we'd be faced with four potential scenarios. Of course, the scenario we wanted was Titan just lightly on the sea floor, the crew intact, the pressure vessel intact. That would have made the sub slightly negative or maybe slightly buoyant. What we did is we tied a, a, you know, a lifting mechanism into the center core of the vehicle, which we could not detach. Right? The, the sub was not getting tracked. They lost tracking and communication, which we, we didn't know where it was. And subsea navigation and knowing where you are is essential for safe operations. We were tracking our vehicle. So once we were, the plan was to grab the Titan. And once grabbed the Titan with our manipulators, then we had it. 
Then it was going to be attaching beacons. We were carrying extra beacons. So if we lost her, other assets could track her. And then we were going to attach this heavy lift capability to the sub. At that point, we would begin the recovery. So the additional planning included the other ROVs that were right with us. They were holding at 2,700 meters. The Horizon Arctic itself had another ROV. We were prepared. That vehicle was prepared to launch. We were prepared to launch that second vehicle to, once we came through 3,000 meters, then these other vehicles could join us. And they would also grab them. Didn't want to lose them. And then at that point, we began the translation to the heavy lift line that deep energy had. And I can't say enough about the, the professionalism and the preparation of the entire response that allowed us to come in as primary and have that weight. I mean, it's just it's, it's a little hard to explain. The visual, of course, is in all of our head. But that was a real opportunity. Now, yeah, who was sat in this control room and with the monitors the time ticked away, obviously there's a lot of talk, of course, about the oxygen running out. Can you kind of describe the mood in the room for you and the crew and really the pressure that you were feeling as time kind of ticked away? I can answer that actually pretty simple. We were focused on the job at hand. That's what we did. That's what all of us did. We were laser focused on rescue. Of course, we had to describe several scenarios, but we were not set for anything else but recovering that source. And that's what everybody was doing. So it was laser focus. Job at hand, safety, get it done. And so the debris that did come up, that was your machine, the Odysseus, that brought that up? Yes. Oh. How many crew members were with you from your team? It's really hard to, I mean, our team was nine, but we immediately integrated into a larger structure on Horizon Arctic. For example, their own ROV had six crew. They became part of our team, this concept of one team. The entire crew of the Arctic, the captain Adam Myers and I worked, you know, seamlessly together. We had our supervisors, um, our dive supervisors. So, you know, I was saying Jesse was running the entire deck ops for us, you know, the whole ROV operation. But our team, <laughs> We assembled an expert team that have worked with us for the years, and that was part of the opportunity for success, right, is that we have to have, we talk a lot about equipment, but it's really ultimately about people. And we are really fortunate to have great people, and we're really fortunate to move into an environment where they were equally high-level professional. Has, has uh, a rescue and recovery been part of your plan right from the beginning, or is this something new that you confronted? We always knew that we'd be called at some point, and so we prepared the system for that. We could have been out on a job, and we wouldn't have been out there. Right. There were other assets that mobilized as well. There was a French ship with their vehicle. They were very importantly there at back, and they were. It was not a race, but it's just. Everybody was going there. And we had been designated primary because the thought would we'd be arriving on site first, which we did. How much did this did this cost? A lot. <laughs> billions, <laughs> billions? <laughs> or are you not you were not sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> what is this? From failure comes advancement. What have you guys learned that will that will advance the the undersea exploration? I think there's a lot to learn. Um, I think we're very proud of the performance of our system. It performed. Our team performed. It, it actually achieved the mission at hand. We were very saddened we couldn't recover a viable cell. But beyond that, the system performed. Down the road, there are certainly things that we'll think about, but we haven't had time. With the solemnity of the event here, knowing that, but also there's this, I gotta tell you, there's a strong sense of pride in this community that you're here. Some people have said, you know, why weren't they over at the coast? I, I know you were, you're in South Wellfleet, Massachusetts, you mentioned Santa Barbara. What was it about East Aurora that you decided to establish your base here and 
we don't want you to leave, but is there any discussion perhaps to have you on a coastal, more of a coastal environment? We're a mobile system. We just got to St. John's, do for a living, probably less than 30 hours. So we're designed for mobility. So in a sense, we can be anywhere. But I've talked about people and community. And I, I really want to say this, that, and I'm going to describe this community. This is one community of probably dozens of communities around the world that came together. And that's why we were successful in getting the system mobilized to the airport, to St. John's, onto the ship, onto site, onto the city. community. And so we're, we are also happy to be here. And uh, we have no intent to What ties you to East Aurora exactly, though? I mean, well, what brings this, this, at least this base of operations to the village? That guy over there. <laughs> <laughs> and if I had, I always to say $1,000 for every time somebody asks me that question, <laughs> I might be retired. But uh, I say this, right? We have, so Eric uh, Peterson is here. Eric, Eric is an MPH engineering. Um, he designed and built this vehicle with us, and is another example of the expertise that needs to come together to create something like this. But not only is the design solid, but the operational capability. When I call, and Eric is one of, you know, half a dozen to a dozen individuals we called who just dropped everything. They came from Skagway, from Vancouver, British Columbia, from Austin, Texas, from uh, Louisiana, you know, from uh, Newfoundland, from Nova Scotia to assemble and to make this a You are continuing to listen in here on the latest in this investigation into the deadly sub implosion that killed all five crew members that were on board on this trip to go see the Titanic wreckage in the Atlantic Ocean. We're gonna take a quick two minute break for some viewers, that's what you'll see. Others will continue to listen in here live as this continues. It's arriving on Monday. So currently, uh, you know, it's on trucks, 